Hello, and welcome to the MIT Open Documentary Lab talk. I'm Sarah Wallison. I'm the director of the MIT Open Documentary Lab. And today we have a panel about digital preservation moderated by William Uricchio. William is the founder and principal investigator of the Open Documentary Lab and the co-creation studio. And he's a media historian who explores how cultures understand reality, how they represent it, and how those representations are deployed. He has a particular interest in emerging media. Uh, before we start, just know that the panel will be about an hour, and then we will have questions from our respondents and from you. Please put your questions in the Q&A section so we can see them. And without further ado, William. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks very much. Um, the panel is made up of three people. I'm going to give very perfunctory uh, introductions because they're going to do a fuller job with illustrations and clips themselves. Uh, Oscar Raby joining us from Melbourne. Uh, Oscar is a multimedia artist and he's creative director of Veritov. Uh, here to talk in the first instance about the preservation of Ascent, but lots of other things as well. Uh, Will Sylvester joining us from Wyoming is uh, principal at Create to Devastate. Um, he's here because of his work on Question Bridge, which is a, a really, it's a nested series of installations and projects that we'll hear more about. And finally, my colleague uh, here uh, at MIT, Kat Cizek, who's joining us from Toronto. And um, Kat is an Emmy and Peabody winning documentary um, director, uh, creator, organizer. Um, and here to talk in the first instance about high rise, but a lot of other stuff as well. Today's topic is the future of the past. Um, that is, we're going to be considering an increasingly precarious space for this very foundational stage of interactive, immersive, location based media forms. Our lab focuses on that work, and that work is in trouble. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about what's threatening these documentaries' future, what strategies we can come up with to, to think about saving them, what to save, what does survival even entail, what would we save of these quite complex uh, ecosystems, what matters aesthetically, technologically, um, financially. The discussion that we're having today kind of um, calls upon some work we did back in 2017 with a conference in Montreal that we uh, did together with Santra Fee and with IDFA, the International Documentary Festival Doc Lab, and with uh, the, the Dutch, uh, the Netherlands Institute for Sound and Vision. That, that convening called Update or Die uh, allowed us to spend a few days with a lot of people who work in this sector to figure out you know, what can we learn from the gaming world? What can we learn from the digital art world? What is distinctive in the interactive documentary world on how to kind of think that through? And what we're doing today is kind of a precursor to something that's gonna happen on November 6th. They're gonna be an online convening, pretty much of those same partners, I think without Santra Fee, uh, talking also about preservation. But what's really good about today is that the people that are going to do most of the talking are artists. They're the people who have made the documentaries. They're not the arch archivists and they're not the technologists. These are the people who work with those worlds, encounter those worlds, but ultimately are the, um, are the artists responsible for the projects. So I think it's going to be good to hear from them um, what the issues are. So before turning to the panel, just a few words. This issue is very personal for me. I started my life as a um, historian of early cinema, and most of my work was in the period between 1895 and 1913. And it's a, it's a kind of strange period because we do have films from that, those very first days of the film medium to work with, but why we have them is curious. We have them because actually the copyright regime for film was introduced, at least in the United States, around 1912. And before 1912, if you wanted to copyright a film, in fact, you had to copyright photographs. So the films that we have today, the films that we still have in our, in our midst, were actually printed on paper and copyrighted as photographs. Um, the problem was that the, the substrate, uh, celluloid nitrate, was pretty volatile, pretty unstable. So anything that would have just been on that celluloid would not be with us today by and large. So thank goodness for that kind of quirk of fate. The other thing that's really interesting in film's case is that the format 
of 35 millimeter is there from the start. The Lumiere brothers used 35 and it's kind of stuck with this, uh, at least in the days of analog ever since. The stuff we work with in the lab, interactive and immersive and installation-based work has no fixed format. It has no fixed technological substrate. Um, there are probably some unexpected traces of this work like the paper prints in film, uh, but maybe that's a thing we can talk about. The question is, are those adequate to the preservation process? And if we can preserve, even if we can preserve, how do we think about access? Who gets their hands on this work? Where would they find it? What kind of interface and equipment would they need? So that's kind of the domain of, uh, of work that, that we're gonna talk about. We're in a fairly nascent period in terms of these technologies. Um, they're quite complex. Many of the projects uh, are, re rely on multiple systems software that's constantly being upgraded or has been acquired by another company and killed. Uh, these are very delicate, precarious ecosystems in some cases. And when one piece fails, the system fails, as, we, as, as those of you that know this sector know just from something like Flash. It's, it's really tricky and it requires a fair amount of maintenance, a fair amount of uh, updating. Um, and the question is, I guess, who's minding the future? Who's thinking about this? Who's, whose job is it to worry about this? Is this, the, is this the artist's job to somehow protect their legacy? Is it the, the commissioning institution's job to make sure that what was commissioned stays with us? Um, where does the money come from for this sort of endeavor? So today, as I said, we're gonna to talk to the artists themselves and see what they think the future of their work should be. Um, is, the, is the ephemerality that's so, that's so pervasive in the digital world, is that something we need to embrace? Do we have to learn to let go? I hope the answer is no, but, but we'll see. Um, so I've asked each of the, the panelists to talk for about 10 minutes uh, about their work and about what they'd like to pass on to posterity. Is it a particular body of knowledge? Is it access to an experience? Is it a beautifully crafted work? Is it a set of instructions? What's What's important for, and we're gonna hear it from, from, from three different voices with three radically different projects, three radically different problematics. So Oscar, why don't we kick off with you since you're in Melbourne and it's around midnight. So um, while you're still awake, let's hear from it. Hello everyone. Um, this is Oscar Ravi from Melbourne and uh, it's 2 a.m. here. So I'll try to do my best <laughs> to make sense. Um, so let me share my screen now. And here we go. Can someone confirm that you're seeing a full screen, black background, white letters, and the name yep. is Oscar Ravi, so that's me. Hello everyone, I'm a multimedia artist. And I'm a director at Vertov. It's a virtual reality studio based in Melbourne, Australia. My focus throughout my, throughout my career as a visual artist has been portraiture in interactive media. For some time, I, I thought I explained it. Um, I started these presentations saying uh, portraiture in new media. But lately, I realized that I was, I was um, not um, representing very well the first incarnation, the first phase of my um, career as a visual artist, which was in performance. So I would like to show you um, some of that today. Within the, the framework of our conversation, um, I think about presentation of VR work, not necessarily as, as the digital piece that we're familiar with, I hope that we're all familiar with, but I think about those days and those years in which I was doing performance art. And there were very uh, important fundamental problems that we were facing when we were working in performance art, me and my fellow artists that I'm going to introduce you to next. Um, and they have to do as much as with the uh, statement, you know, the, the, the political within the art, as with the technique and the presentation of it, the material presentation of performance art. So let me show you um, some work. Back in 2005, we were working in, 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 as a collective with my fellow artists. 
we were we were basically starving artists so we would we would be doing i was doing online advertising which is how i got into computers and but but we were also living together um in a shared house and we were talking about philosophy and we were talking about um, art and we were talking about how to you know do these things that we love doing so much and that are important for us and our ideas how to fix the world and how to break it apart and fix it again in different ways and all those things we did in our shared house that shared house we wanted to take uh, to the gallery and make it an event so we created this piece called living karaoke in which we built a uh, inflatable bubble, you, the kind of bubbles that you find in like an, like a, like an inflatable a bouncy ca castle. And we put our living room inside that um, bubble and invited the audience to just come to the gallery. Inside the, the bubble, in, we, we had a collection of um, karaoke videos, which is basically what we did after singing uh, after talking about philosophy and talking about art, we would, more often than not, we would end up singing karaoke together. So we created about 100 different videos um, to show in that, in that show. This is the type of video that we created. Feel free to join if, if you feel like breaking into song. Ah, it's 2 a.m. here, so just bear that in mind. <laughs> um, so yes, um, found footage from the internet uh, of you know crash tests with pop songs. All of that happening. Uh, in that space. The thing itself wasn't the video, the thing, um, the show was not the audience, but it was the gathering of the audience, seeing all the people perform within this bubble. So the, the bubble itself, the living room, the videos were excuses to see what we were doing, looking at each other, doing these things that we did as artists, you know, getting together and talking about anything, about things. We wanted to see ourselves reflected in, in perhaps a broader community, the community of the gallery, that is. Here's another work. This one was a series of fights, of boxing fights. That I did across um, throughout South America. Uh, this one was in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and the, the piece was uh, made by um, inviting artists of all kind of, of techniques and, and walks of life. So you would find poets fighting with illustrators, fighting with curators, fighting with digital artists, and um, in all surprising ways, because you know, you, if you're invited to fight, you just get in the ring and see what happens. And my friend Jorge here was not expecting to get such a, um, a response from Vicky. Um, like I said, the invitation was open to just get in the ring and, and follow a very, very basic uh, script in, in the type of script that you find in a theater play. But the thing that, you, that I want to show you is how it's structured. You know, I have a, can you see my cursor? Can you see my arrow key? Yes. So I'm showing up here. Now I have a block in which I'm defining what the characters are. So what people will be doing. And as they enter the ring, I would tell them, okay, you're going to be fighting, with, sorry, the contender A, you, the next one is going to be contender B, there was going to be a referee. And then down here, I have the actions for each one of those characters or performers. While they enter the ring, of course, they were performing a boxing fight. That would be a conventional um, thing to do. I mean, more or less, you've seen uh, how a, a fight, a boxing fight um, develops. Um, what sort of say, technique you have to, to get involved in that fight, that's up to you. 
but there were other things happening as well. So each one of the contenders got the sole of the feet soaked in paint. We have one contender with black paint, another one with red paint, and the referee would have yellow paint. The canvas where they were performing the fight ended up being a triptych a painting that was shown, um, exhibited after the, the performances as a, in a separate show. And it was accompanied, accompanied with videos and pictures from the event. Like I said before, the script, the people, even the painting, they were not the thing. They were not the ultimate goal or the end goal. The, the goal was to see what happened when we combined all these things. In certain way, I was using, I was combining, uh, like I said before, the, you know, the day job and the night job. Night, the day job being in front of computers, thinking about um, you know, online advertising, which got me burnt out pretty quickly. And the night job being, you know, how do we get bodies in space to do something meaningful? Those two things, how do we create uh, a script you know, that somehow tells people what to do without telling them, them exactly what they need to do and the way they, they you know, and, and describe the appearance of the work in its entirety. So when I show you this painting, is this is a byproduct, a subproduct of that process of gathering people and giving them an excuse to do something. So fast forward to 2014 and I'm uh, directing VR, um, narrative VR work. You can see on the screen, uh, I made a piece about my family and during the dictatorship years in Chile, Ascent, as well as working, being able to work with the BBC in two other pieces, um, Easter Rising about the uprising in Dublin, 1916, um, and The Turning Forest, a, um, a um, fiction piece about a creature in facing loneliness. These pieces, um, I'm hoping that you're already by now, and if you don't get, if you didn't get tired already, you're familiar with VR and how it, what it looks like and what it is and, and how you, you experience a VR piece. But the things that, that somehow get um, forgotten or don't get, talk, don't get talked much in terms of the preservation conversation is um, how we present this work. These are two renders, two, two pre-visualization renders that we presented, we created for the um, installation at Sundance New Frontier in 2015 for Ascent. The pre-visualization, and this is, this is a very fortunate <laughs> occasion, is very close to what ended up being the final product. So what I'm showing you here is that somehow the process of creating the circumstances, and, and, and please think of this in the, in, the, in the light of performance art. This is the boxing ring, yeah, this is the canvas, this is, this is the band playing next to the contenders, is presented here. As much VR as it is happening within the headset. So for me, um, the spotlight that I want to put on is, this space is not just a space, as such, um, Cartesian space, that's what I'm talking about, but also it's part of the narrative of, of what's happening within the headset. And that started way before the event itself. 
that's one approach, yeah? The, the approach of, of creating the circumstances, the physical circumstances of the exhibition. Another approach that I want to highlight is um, in 2015, a um, friend of mine, an industrial designer based in London, Paula Zugotti, created this book uh, in which she captured the life of, of people um, throughout 24 hours. But th that portrait was made by the objects they touched during that day. So um, I was very happy and fortunate that she chose me to come and visit uh, all the way from London to here to Melbourne and capture one day in my life through the objects that I was touching. Those years, uh, in 2015, I was just after finishing the first run of Ascent. You can actually see down here is it something's back. Uh, but you can see also all the tools and the materials that I was using those days. You can find the Oculus Rift version one, the Oculus Rift version two. And this, I think it's a very, very good uh, catalog of what's involved in the, in the work of that VR piece. And at large, the work of, of being involved in working with VR. It's not just what happens within the headset, uh, but also what happens uh, around uh, in terms of the objects and the tools that you get involved with because those tools have embedded narratives. And the third point that I want to highlight came from the observation of this. You know, sometimes you're too close to the material, too close to your work that you don't see what you're working with. But the minute that we lay out, laid out this catalog of things that I was working with, um, we realized together in our conversation that the script was also fundamental to understand what I was working with. Because my work it wasn't, wasn't just moving tribals around or, or staring at the screen for you know, the best part of the day, but also writing. Uh, script so that we decided to include it as a print which is funny it's a good segue i think from what william mentioned before that script was materialized there as a way to say you know i'm not only working with objects that have a very um, a clear material and physical dimension but also there is another set of, of objects which somehow um, escape the control of, of the material, um, the materiality of the other objects. So I want to close this um, presentation with the three things that I think are fundamental to, to think, at least when I think, and I would like the archivists and the people that are thinking about preservation of VR work in particular, is to consider the context in which the VR work happens. And that's why I introduced that it happened in a film festival. It's not an art gallery, it's not a museum, it happened at a, film at a film festival, that particular piece. And that I think is a very important context in a, um, in a mediography sense, in a historical sense. The means, that means the means of production, you know, not just the objects, but the value and how do they see it and the accessibility to those objects. And not just the, the technical objects, but also you know the nutritional objects, the the other things that are involved in making VR. And at the third point, the language involved, because language is is the glue of all all these things. That's why we, we ended up putting those prints between the objects. Is how you make them make sense to each other, not just to us, but to each other. Those objects that are defined first, and then are put into action by the functions which is very close and very similar to what, it, what I was doing when I was doing performance art. Thank you. Thank you, Oscar. Thanks very much. Um, wow, lots to think about there and anticipated lots of questions I have. Great. Will, why don't we turn to you in scenic Wyoming and uh, hear about Question Bridge and kind of the, yeah. Awesome. Go for it. Thank you for having me. Um, so let me, I guess let me just introduce myself. My name is Will Sylvester. Um, I'm an artist, uh, sometimes a technologist, um, and I've helped create Question Bridge, um, Truth Booth, In Search of the Truth with the Cause Collective, and a few other projects with our collective. Let me share my screen a little bit. And I will. I want to first show you all a clip uh, from Question Bridge, just to give you sort of a context about what it is about, um, if you don't know it already. Um, and then I'll talk a bit more about um, the creation and some of the, the process in it. Oh, yeah. 
if I get my thing to work correctly. Hold on. So I have a question for you. What does it mean to you to be a black male? What is your purpose in life? How do we reclaim our communities? At what point do young people stop respecting the elders? What are you doing to make your world and your community a better place? How? How? How do we break the cycle? Why? Why? Why do so many of us live in the present tense? What? What? What is the last word that we can remember you by as a black man? For your last day on this earth, what is the last, what is the word, a word that we can remember you by? On the last word as a black man that I would like to be remembered by is warrior. Sincere. Motivated. Dedicated. The proper balance. Family oriented. Honesty. And as a student of Baha'u'llah. He's seen the light and changed. Creative, because if you don't know, man, I'm the creator. Thoughtful. Responsibility. Empowerment. Danny Simmons, artist. Father, I think is the greatest thing a black man can be. Father. So um, that clip illustrates uh, a five screen presentation. Um, on the left, you'll see a photo of the five television screens with the five people on it um, at the Museum of uh, History in St. Louis. Um, Question Bridge is a mediated uh, dialogue um, between black men using video. Um, a black male will ask a question um, by looking directly into the camera. And we would take that question around um, to other black men who would look directly into the camera and answer that question as if they were talking uh, to that person. Um, we were able to find um, initially 160 black men from all across the United States um, to ask and answer questions. And uh, what we created from that was an installation both a uh, five channel, meaning that it was on five different individual screens and a single channel, which was the presentation I just saw, showed you, which was just having the appearance of a five channel on a single channel. Um, we were thinking of ways in order to exhibit and how we could, uh, I guess, present it in the most, in most places possible. Um, so that if you know we were in a museum, uh, we could get together and do five channels and do it big and you know have all these sort of tech tech things around. Um, but for instance, um, we did a presentation at the YMCA where we would show it on a single channel, and the idea was to be as accessible as possible um, to the larger audience. Um, and actually the screen on the right is in a house um, in Houston as part of uh, Project Row Houses um, and one of their events. Um, we then moved on to take it online um, and sort of open up the conversation to in invite more, uh, more people to join in. So we have a website, questionbridge.com um, that has been up for almost, I think, seven years now, I think is how long it's been running, um, and invite people to log on um, and record a video. Um, for a while, we were uh, using, we created um, an iOS and an Android app, um, but I'll probably talk more about this later, but it, it became a little hard to sustain. Um, there are, you know, tons of uh, expenses that come with having an app um, that, you know, we didn't necessarily know at the time. And so, you know, Question Bridge uh, for myself and my collaborators and the creators of Question Bridge became sort of this uh, initial step into this world of creating a project that could continue and have legs and understanding what that meant. Um, so, uh, we actually ended up one of the ways we wanted to kind of wrap up documenting uh, Question Bridge was creating a book. Um, and so in the book, you have the questions and the answers written down. Um, and so that a person could open the book and read essentially the transcript of Question Bridge. 
Um, and another way we also wanted to sort of keep it going was using an educational curriculum and bringing it into schools and talking about um, one of the main focuses of Question Bridge was just the idea of implicit bias, um, what we see people um, and how we sort of understand them from first glances and then when we get to talk to them, we get to know more about them and sort of understanding that, you know, what we see may not be, you know, what we think people are. Um, the next project uh, I want to talk to you about is uh, the Truth Booth, In Search of the Truth, the Truth Booth. Um, again, another media project uh, in, in about around dialogue. Um, it's a large inflatable uh, booth that a person can walk into and they have up to two minutes to say whatever the truth is to them, starting with the statement, the truth is. Um, let me show a real quick clip from that. And that's the booth right there for you. The truth is living your life in the foot to the fullest. Um, the truth is being a real person, not faking, showing people who you are and not trying to be like everybody else. The truth is being a leader, not a follower, believing in yourself, no matter what nobody else say. The truth is uh, fungible. Uh, I like to think that if you if you live long enough, everything turns out all right. The truth is I am a tomboy and I hate pink and I hate princesses. That's the truth. The truth is really small. It's very hard to see. But if you look really, really close, you will find the truth. And it's all around. So, um... Uh you can see the truth booth and the interface inside that records everything. Um, so one of the things that uh, we did was create this inflatable uh, sculpture that then you could walk into and participate with. Um, we've been lucky enough to travel around the world, um, Ireland, Afghanistan, uh, Australia, uh, South Africa, and um, more, more recently we did Mexico. Oh, and we did do a 35 state tour of the United States in the, during the 2016 election, which brought out so many truths and was incredibly enlightening. Um, and almost like a, for me, a precursor to the next four years. Um, but the cool thing about being able to do this project um, was just, traveling and learning from people and understanding that, you know, truth is can be very different and have a very different meaning to people. Um, but one of the things that, again, sort of we incurred was just like the abundance of media and, and how do we figure out how to display that um, and how do we work with that. And so a few of the ways we started to work with it um, was we created a website in search of the truth.net um, where you can go and um, we can exhibit all of the truths that we have gathered. Um, and at this time, I believe we are somewhere upwards about 10,000, if not 12,000 truths um, from around the world. Um, and then we also do gallery and museum exhibitions um, on the right, you can see an exhibition from the Cranbrook in Detroit. Um, and we can also, what was fun was being able to specifically tailor uh, exhibitions to communities. Um, this one is purely of the Detroit and Flint uh, truths that we collected during that time. Um, and interestingly that, you know, we've had to kind of start to rethink because of the pandemic um, about how we go around collecting truths. Um, this is still an ongoing project. Um, and so we are now, you know, working on finding different ways. We're sort of back to that web app thing, that idea, um, or possibly doing something with AR. And you can see the aesthetic of having the white background and trying to recreate that um, so that people can still submit truths in their uh, home and maybe not do it so much as a, you know, go to the booth when it shows up kind of activity. Um, but hopefully we can try to figure out something 
something creative in order to continue to uh, search for the truth. Um, the next project uh, I want to share is a project I did with Hank Willis Thomas um, called Black Righteous Space. Um, and I'm sharing this project because it's a, a very different sort of thing from the filming and the media and collecting stuff like that. This project uh, is about participation. It's a participatory art piece um, that we invite the audience to speak into a microphone and there's a projected image on a screen that um, is manipulated when uh, you speak into the microphone. Um, and so uh, the photo on the left is a man in South Africa um, twisting, disrupting the image of the AWB flag, which uh, was sort of like the, the Nazi party of South Africa, if you will. Um, and we would take images of these flags. We did the stars and bars, um, the rebel flag from the United States, the AWB, and then we also did the Nazi flag um, when we did a presentation in Germany. Um, and so you as the participant, as the viewer, can step up the microphone and manipulate and transform and sort of the idea behind the power of words and uh, how, you know, we can disrupt and change and morph the world around us just with the words that we have. Um, this was uh, software generated. Um, it was the f my first step into coding uh, that I'd ever done. Um, and it was an experience because now as software changes and develops, um, my program is becoming quickly out of date. <laughs> um, and I think with this, probably latest round of Mac OS changes. I think it actually will be officially out of date. Um, and so it's one of those things where, you know, as an artist, I wasn't thinking about it at the time that like stuff might go out of date, even though using a computer, I understand that, you know, I got to update my OS every once in a while. Um, but it was, you know, like I said, it was my first experience in coding and I had never done it before. And it was just, definitely a lesson in how, you know, thinking about software, but also hardware with Question Bridge and the Truth Booth, how, you know, time over time things start to change. And so, you know, now we're in a process, like I said, with, with Truth Booth of how do we rethink how we present and interact with our audience um, and to the, you know, Black Righteous Space, like how do we, do we recode? Do we uh, do we start anew? What do we do with this art piece? And this art piece is a bit different than the other two because this is actually like a gallery piece. It's a museum piece. Um, so, you know, then becomes the question of, is it really our responsibility or is it somebody else's responsibility to maintain these things um, and update them and, you know, keep them preserved for future? Um, just gonna show you a quick clip and, uh, That'll be it for me. Windpipe worn from screaming from the burning of your kinfolk. It's like a fire in the ghetto right outside the window. Windpipe worn from screaming from the burning of your kinfolk. How on earth does life become a sinkhole? Loco, local, vocally a rider. I'm a ghost on a spinning globe. I sh in flaming icy blue. You see me. I'm a fucking rider in a frat of fatherless boys. Watch us toil, the black spine recoils like intifada by the border between Brahmins. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thanks. Wow. Well, wow, that's uh Kat, uh you're up. Let's hear a little about your work and your priorities. Thanks. Wow, thank you so yeah. much. Um uh, Oscar and Will, it's so wonderful to see your trajectory and um, throughout, uh, throughout uh, your engagement with uh, technologies, but also this, these incredible live performances and participatory acts. They're really phenomenal. Um, and uh, yeah, how do, we, 
how do we preserve this for the future and the past? Very good questions. I think I've got, I'm at the end of my presentation instead of the beginning. That's pretty symbolic, isn't it? Um, where do we start and where do we end? Um, uh, I'm, my name is Kat Cizek and uh, I'm the artistic director of the co-creation studio here at uh, ODL. When I say uh, here, I mean MIT, but I'm actually a Canadian and I live in Toronto, Canada. And um, uh, the uh, early part of my working life uh, was in documentary. Um, and then I began working at the National Film Board of Canada in the early knots. Um, we always like to talk about uh, the early project Filmmaker in Residence, which was a digital project as having started before YouTube even existed. And so it's again, that, that sort of um, reflection that Will was making about um, how things change as we're making things and how do we respond, engage, adapt, look back. Um, but the project I'm going to talk about today is High Rise, which was um, a seven year project at the National Film Board of Canada. Um, and uh, yeah, it had lots of um, lots of interesting uh, tentacles um, to it. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, this is the map that we, we've used to draw it out. Um, there were sort of five or six core projects to it that all had ancillary sort of, uh, much like Oscar and Will's work, um, uh, just many different ancillaries. So uh, anything from live performances to um, uh, coding workshops, participatory workshops, radio, uh, participatory like user submissions. Um, and, but they were always grounded in, uh, and centered in a, in a digital, um, digital project. Um, and it really spanned from local to global. So a lot of our interventions here in Toronto uh, were both based up in an inner suburb called um, Etobicoke uh, at two high rises where we worked for about uh, six, six or seven years throughout the course of the project, as well as City Hall and working with uh, people downtown. Um, uh, but then it spanned globally uh, around the world. Um, and I, 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 I really appreciate how Oscar talked about um, uh, the work that uh, that uh, he's done with his colleagues and about the context and the means and the language and, and the way I was thinking about, you know, how do we think about um, preserving or archiving our work? There's by story, there's by the technology or the platform, um, by the process and by the assets. So I'm just going to walk through high rise thinking, um, thinking about it through these, these lenses. Um, so first of all, by story. Um, High Rise had about five uh, major interventions, and I'll just show you three clips just to give you a sense of, of the kinds of themes and, and thinking and voices that came, came through with that project. Desde mi ventana, eh, por la mañana me gusta pararme y ver el mar. También me gusta, según como esté el día y ver el mar, llegarme hasta Bolivia. So that was at my window. This gives you a sense of the last project called Universe Within. <laughs> High rises are a kind of metaphor for the way we live today, physically together, but very much apart. You shut the door to your apartment and connect to the world through the internet. In my apartment, I have a laptop, my iPhone, a table, and three chairs. Sometimes I picture the internet as a spider web and all these little bugs trying to get out. Finally, I'll give you a sense of um, short history of high rise. The new luxury high rise places are getting smarter, greener, taller, while the new low rent trend downtown is to make the units smaller and smaller and smaller.
I'm just as reflecting on the New York Times piece that in itself was digging into the New York Times own kind of forgotten archives of six to eight million undigitized photographs. And we were part of a movement there at the New York Times to try and bring bring these photographs into the digital realm. And um, these aren't these aren't from that collection, but the, the, the many of the historical photos uh, from that project are so kind of a revitalization uh, process as well. Um, so by platform technology, um, I, I'll just list some of the technologies that many of you are probably familiar with. Um, a lot of in-browser stuff, um, and then a lot of outside browser stuff too. Uh, Touch Developer was, for example, um, uh, software that we used for some of our live presentations. Um, we worked with WebGL um, in, in the first sort of iteration of a documentary in that platform. Um, we also pioneered some early 360 tech um, using the camera that Google had, um, had actually uh, used for its uh, street, uh, street View project. We sort of adapted it to capture um, 24 frames per second. Um, and just a lot of, you know, we, we used a depth kit live on stage in, in the early days of depth kit installations. We had a radio show, good old radio show that actually gave us probably the biggest prominence in our own city because this was a very, very um, listened to show. Assets, um, I think the same as Will and Oscar's projects, just a phenomenal number of, um, of independent uh, artifacts. Um, that built the, 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 greater, the greater whole. And finally, by process, I think um, Oscar touched on this as the well. The citizens felt the need for um, better communication. It's an old clip. But from, the uh, established Alex media McCain, are not accessible to ordinary people, especially the poor. The idea of participatory we therefore um, asked ourselves methods, this question. What could happen if the people had the technology of communications? Support in their own educational hands. Educational components, we had a lot of uh, educational materials, a lot of functions as well, and we feel are as much part of high rise <laughs> as the, <laughs> the stories. <laughs> so what remains at the end of the day right now, today in 2020? Um, we've got, we've still got the websites. Um, some of them are harder to access as flash sites, but NFB has maintained all those sites for now. Um, the short history of high rise actually lives on the New York Times server. Um, so that's over there. We've got some of our code at GitHub. We have two books. One's just coming out now. It's more of an academic book. Um, some thinking, some bigger thinking around um, theoretical and, and field work around um, this connection of the of virtuality and density which was kind of a, a big theme throughout the High Rise project. And, and we have a book um, that was really published for a young, uh, young uh, like a YA audience um, with some of the stories inside. We have um, documentation at places like, uh, so valuable, uh, the MIT ODL Open Doc Lab DocuBase um, at Co-Creation Studio. A lot of the process is now, um, I think, um, at least codified a little bit in the collective wisdom field study. There's lots of scholarship that references the work and press. And finally, um, archives. Because we're a National Film Board of Canada project, we are within the conventional film uh, archive there. Uh, all our assets are, are, are held there. Um, big questions at the NFB on how to, how to maintain and, and uh, make sure this work is accessible. Uh, which has been a theme throughout the you know, 70 or I think it's 80 year now long history of the, of the institution. Um, and we're also walk, uh, working thanks to William uh, with uh, the Netherlands Institute for Sound and Vision as well as um, uh, IDFA to do a walkthrough of some, of some of the flash projects that are becoming less accessible. Um, and I think the big question for us is, um, you know, we have these different lenses onto the onto the project but is there a way to to somehow uh, have a creative treatment a creative act on how to archive this work that it's not just a documentation but becomes a creative act unto itself yes, that's where I'll, I'll leave us thank you thank you Kat and thank all of, this is really terrific and just a, a resounding evidence that the issues today are not the film analog that we tend to carry with us. There's an artifact and, oh, we can save that artifact and life will be perfect. 
all of you have really demonstrated the um, richly, I'll, I'll use the T word, the transmedia uh, character of this work. That, that process is fundamental, that there is a huge amount of stuff that's happening before, during, and after that is that, that in different ways are, are, are part of, of the projects. And, um, and Kat, I really like how you said, you know, we, we need to think of this as a creative act. What do we do? Uh, I think of like, what are you, a snail? You know, how do we keep a snail? We have the hard shell that stays around pretty well, that, that bit. But it says nothing about the creature that lived inside. And the trails that it traces on our, on our patios and balconies is, you know, where does, how do we, how do we reimagine this as not just a collection of shells, but actually something that captures um, a, a fuller whole? And I, I guess just to start, I mean, all of you have demonstrated, A, that you document your work, which is terrific. I, I, I hope that's widespread in the artistic community. But I guess the question I have is, what, what is sufficient? What is a sufficient amount of, uh, of, of traces, of experiences, of, of, of documents to have to, to convey what you want to give? Um, all of you have done a great job. But if an archivist looks at this, it's daunting. It's a lot of stuff. What is necessary and sufficient to sort of to keep you happy and to make you feel that what you've been after is, uh, is going to survive? And Will and Oscar, turn on your mics and jump in at Will, Cat as well. Um, any thoughts? Uh, I, for me, um, what I think is the most important, and I actually am thinking a lot about Oscar's documentation of his performance work, um, is like the idea of the, for me, it's the idea of the installation um, and archiving that and also the the documenting and archiving of the presentation of the work um i think are probably the two most important aspects for me um the installation obviously because for me that is the work um is creating the installations and creating sort of the presentation of it but then to document the presentation and the feel around it and trying to keep that alive um, as the visitors, you know, view the work and interact with the work, you know, what was that like for its time? Um, and then, you know, as the, as time goes on, the installation gets represented, you know, over and over again, how do we try to recapture um, the feel of the presentation in the future um, for visitors so that they can have that moment in time um, that was, you know, then and now. And, and to be, maybe, I'm not sure if it's provocative or not, but Oscar, it sounds like, just to connect this, it sounds a little bit like you were advocating a John Cage position. Give us the instructions, you know, and that's what lives on. I mean, the, 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 the whatever, whatever it is, one minute and 18 seconds, however long that piece is, that's, it's the instructions and you read it and that's sufficient. And I'm trying to, so, so uh, with Will, do you, want the pre, do you want the installation to physically be around or is a, would a book version with instructions be sufficient? Like what, how, I, I don't know if I'm mis, mischaracterizing Oscar here, but just to understand. No, I mean, material. yeah, for, for me, it's, I think, I, ultimately all of the above, right? <laughs> You want to keep every piece, all the assets, all the things around in order, you know, for them to live on. Um, I think what's just hard, I, especially for the projects that we do, which are a lot of digital um, clips. And I'm going to say clips because they really are just like little short interviews or short statements, um, pieces that, you know, get moved from hard drive to hard drive and, you know, server to server. And you, it's, it becomes a very daunting task to hold on to like truth booth where it's like 10,000, you know, and trying to catalog all of that and keep all that. So I'm, for me, I'm, it's important for that to make the artwork, but less important to keep that necessarily in the archive, although I would love to, but you know, the cost of it becomes prohibitive. Um, so finding ways in order to just document the final project, um, document and keep the final product alive in a way that is sustainable for hopefully an institution 
um, or just really myself um, in a way that I can hold on to it and then represent it in another way uh, is, is definitely the most important. Okay, great. And Oscar, did I, did I push too far on that or? No, absolutely page, right. Page is where it's at. It's flux, it is full fluxus. It is that thing of um, fluxus in instructional art. If we can repeat something, but never, I mean, if, if we can just let ourselves make something repeatable with the full notion that, that it's not going to be the same, regardless of, of how close you follow the instructions, it's never going to be the same. So this, um, if you embrace that notion, you can have it as a creative kind of fuel, as a creative act, because a, a pattern for creative acts as well as a um, documentation itself, because every time you repeat it, you're somehow doing, you know, um, repeating the, the original model. And you're kind of increasing that um, ship of Theseus uh, model over and over again, and it's going to take a different shape, but, but you're repeating it again. So what I'm saying is perhaps I'm conflating and merging what the what do we call this person, the user, the first person audience, you know, the, the, the um, audience of the piece of art, of the artwork, as well as the archivist, they become the one, yeah. the one person with just different roles. And, and on this thing of repeating things, I wanted to actually, I put it here in the chat. Um, this is a really, really good story. It's to be, to be read later. Um, about from, from Borges, the Argentinian writer, about a guy that set out to write the entirety of the Quixote. And Quixote is, for the Spanish-speaking world, is, is like Hamlet, right? It's one of those foundational pieces of literature. So Pierre Menard set out to write Quixote word by word in its entirety, as he's, you know, this is going to be my legacy. Of course, he couldn't do it, and I'm gonna, not going to spoil the whole story. But the key, the gist, the, the, the heart of the story is that uh, it doesn't matter if you do it entire, entirely uh, word by word verbatim. There's a completely different set of circumstances that's going to change that original recipe. Um, so in, in terms of going back to instructional art, I totally believe in that, is that if you can get some sort of material excuse to, to, you know, release instructions. It doesn't matter what form it takes. It's just the instruction is the thing. Yeah. And especially if you, if you conceive of your work, as you said, as, as performance art, right? The instructions are vital. That, that makes sense. But someone like Kat is working in a, what was working in an institutional frame that was media bound. Uh, it's the National Film Board. So film is a kind of an artifact. It is performed, some might argue, but, but a lot of film people would argue that the artifact, the materiality really matters. And Kat, how does that, how does that play out both with your personal thinking and also the kind of institutional frame you're in, we're in? Yeah, I think public, uh, speaking to uh, sort of reflecting on what Will and Oscar have been talking about, this, this notion of the public archive and what do we choose to remember and how do we do it is, is, is been a crucial question at the National Film Board, for sure, um, especially with this turn into the digital. And um, how do we, uh, who decides how that happens and what gets erased? Uh, it's, those are big questions um, that um, nations and communities grapple with. Um, so I think those are all bound in, um, in the decisions we make and what we decide to archive and why. I mean, is it, is it to observe the past and say that happened? Or is it, um, as, as I think all of us are suggesting, that it's something that we put our hands on and we continue a conversation that goes over generations and over time and um, maintains power within the hands of artists and communities and uh, people beyond the gatekeepers. So th those are all big questions for me personally, and I think also at the film board. Mm -hmm. Let me just remind the audience, to, I see there are a couple of questions, but please send them in. We're gonna jump over to that in a minute. Let me ask about um, responsibility. And with responsibility comes finance. Who, like, who stands behind this? Artists, obvi obviously all of you have a vested interest in making sure that your work 
in one way or another survives. Um, I, I, I assume, I don't know, I feel that way a bit about my writing. I'm not fetishistic about it, but it wouldn't be a bad thing not to flush it all. Um, but but so, so Kat, you're in an institutional frame which is publicly funded and there is a public remit. And as you just explained, um, that brings with it a certain ethos about what should be saved, should things be sh saved or whatever. So I'm curious about how that plays out. I know a lot of places, especially publicly funded places, are under budgetary pressure always. I know media organizations tend to be forward looking and not so much interested in what was yesterday, but always about tomorrow. Where, where, who should be standing behind this work? Um, do we have a cultural, I mean, it sounds like we have a cultural obligation, but how is that manifest? Where is that embodied? What form does that take or should it take? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a firm believer in in public space, and that's not just physical space; it's also the digital space, and um, a continuing living um, relationship with uh, the you know the artistic community of, of a community of, of of a nation, for example. Uh, for I think that the NFB is, is has really tried this on many levels. One thing, for example, um, there's a substantive amount of um, in the collection. Uh, that relates either is about indigenous communities or made by indigenous people. Um, and there was a big project in the last few years to go back and reconsider it, reconsider the way it's been labeled, the way it's been archived, the way it's been understood, the way it's been written about in the little blurbs when you go through. And it's, it's, it's actually been a phenomenally interesting project to think about how it revitalizes and uh, rethinks um, the work made. So uh, there's just many, many different aspects to this. And I think we can apply that also to, um, to new media work. Will, Oscar? I want to bring up um, open source. I've, I've recently rediscovered open source, not as a practice, because you know, I think everyone that works with software somehow has become familiarized with open source at a practical level um, one time or another. But uh, the birth of open source was somehow the same thinking that we're trying to tackle. Do we give responsibility to an institution and do we wait for them to, you know, come to terms with the need and our needs, or perhaps we find a community that has an embedded intrinsic interest in just keep evolving it, right? Because the other thing is, does it have to be, does it have to be kind of shaped into one particular form and that's, that's the gold standard of, of the artwork or the practice? Mm -hmm. And I would like to, pref I would prefer to think about the practice because the kind of the, the initial points and the ending points are less defined. So in the practice, Maybe there's a button that uh, someone can, someone else can take and 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 distribute and progress it. And you were part of a longer chain. But coming back to open source, that was an attempt that has survived and has grown so strongly to to figure out how do we maintain something that one person cannot maintain on their own. You know, and that's what we heard back in 2017 when we had the conference that if you want software that's going to be durable and persist and, uh, you know, that go to the open source stuff. Don't go to the proprietary stuff. It's too ephemeral. Um, I want to just see if we have any fellows who have questions to raise. Um, not, any hands, any questions? I, I have a few questions on the screen. Uh, I'll take one here first from Tara Roberts. What has changed, if anything, uh, sorry, this is, uh, this is to Will. What has changed, if anything, as a result of sharing Question Bridge with Black men around the country? Are you tracking social, cultural, personal change in participants? What question slash answer did you find most surprising or most touching? And I just want to step back from that question, Tara, forgive me, but just to say, what audiences do with this is another really interesting piece of, of the record and whether we say that or not is a question, but, but uh, Will. Um, so let me see if I can tackle all of that and part of it. Um, so with Question Bridge, uh, we were, let's see, from, we first launched it in 2012, actually at New Frontiers um, and it, continually, and actually it's continuing to show, in fact, um, it's showing at the Brooklyn Museum coming up next month um, as part of uh, outdoor series they're doing. Um, and 
for maybe about from 2012 to about 2017, uh, we were actively um, as a team uh, doing exhibitions and you know organizing some of the talks and things around it. Um, so we were actively tracking uh, you know viewership as far as like you know attendance um, and 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 you know, from us sitting there watching or getting reports from museums and things and uh, theaters or, you know, wherever it was showing, um, we would kind of get an idea of who was seeing it. And it was everybody, um, you know, it was, you know, anybody and everybody who had some interest other, you know, whether it was going to a museum or going into a space um, or just trying to get an idea of understanding black male identity um, at this time. And so, um, you know, it, 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 I don't think we ever like really pinpointed demographically, you know, what it was. Um, and I don't necessarily think we would want to, um, but it was just um, the amount of people being able to see it was always important to us. And then we'd also have the web statistics of, you know, who was coming to the website um, and where from, which was a lot easier because, you know, it's online. So IP address tells you a lot of information. <laughs> Uh, it gives you a lot of info about people <laughs> and where they're coming from and how they're, you know, engaging and their activity on the site. Um, I hope I answered all the parts of that question. <laughs> Questions from any of the fellows? Nadav, please. So thank you all for sharing this really inspiring stuff. So. Uh, I was thinking, I was really struck by how Oscar started off with talking about um, referencing kind of the tradition of live work rather than, you know, um, I don't know, like media production or film necessarily. And kind of thinking along those lines when I was listening to all of you and thinking about the similarity in kind of creating something that lasts to, you know, even like nonprofit community work, right? Or anything like that, right? Where you organize, where you kind of have an initial vision, you get it going, and then you need to give it enough inertia or momentum. But then in those contexts, there's often then the question of when do you let go, right? When do you kind of like, kind of it's rolling with its own momentum and then you can kind of um, let it do its own thing and evolve and the community takes a hold of it. And maybe it's related to what was mentioned about open source too, but I'm wondering if you've considered any of these projects uh, going in those directions and you know what are the considerations of going to that like when when if at all can you let go and let it kind of continue on its own you know what, what we say in these circles is uh, art is never finished only abandoned so. <laughs> uh, but but the other thing um, is is that that passing of the baton it's um it's a hard one when when you don't want to and i'm 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 talking about from my experience um when you don't want to when you're not ready when it's not your thing to have a large community like a scale a community at scale because it, it, i think that every time we talk about a community practice community a community of interest we talk about you know hundreds of people and they're going to take the the weight off your shoulders and somehow you're the seed of some sort of thought um but that hasn't been my experience my experience has been you know two people three four five it's, it's a big group when you when you are trying to come up with an, an artistic statement that has punch right that is not just you know part of a trend um so I, I don't really know how to start answering that uh, other than, than you just have to abandon it and see that, that it dies off and you don't feel anything about it or you, you, you know, let it have, have its own life until it doesn't have anything to say anymore. Yeah, I, I think, um, it's a question of also, uh, you know, how much you own of it. And a lot of the work that we did in High Rise, um, it really was about many players from many different worlds coming together to do things that none of, none of us would have done on our own. And so, um, yeah, we parted ways, but everybody carries a part of the project in their own worlds as well. So it's less about, you know, us building something and leaving it and 
in you know designing it in that way for people to come and more about it's a journey that we take on together and we're on a path and maybe we we go off for a little bit and we find each other again later down the road i mean especially with nonfiction, because because sometimes the topics are are sensitive topics precarious social topics people's views change um context change Have, has anyone run into and everyone signs a waiver and i know legally it's this is not an issue but it's more of an ethical issue the transformation of work because of changing opinions of some of the subjects in the film where people look at themselves later uh and then sort of think maybe this is not what i want and um rewrite history in a sense i mean this is not this is not the only space for this debate but has any have any of you come across that sort of a problem or i, I can talk to that in in this is kind of next door to what you're asking for but it's pretty close mm -hmm. we talk um about ascent which is the work that i, I referred in our presentation and and people that have the um the luck to be at, at one of the festivals when it has been shown know what we're talking about most people just get it as a hearsay like they didn't see it that they, they have not been able to see it anywhere because it hasn't been published and it hasn't been published because it's the story about my father who uh up until last year was still on trial so we didn't want to publish it so it wouldn't interfere with the trial Um, I can give you an update. My dad is serving a sentence now at home, um, which is connected to the story that we, we um, talk about in Ascent. That is kind of, <laughs> for me, what you're talking about. Like, how do I, how do I you know, sh keep sharing these things and th th these things that are very important to me because they're my professional life mixed with the, Um, not so much ethical, but emotional uh, you know, responsibility of not affecting his life. Um, that, that, I think it's, um, it's kind of one of those considerations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, so I've only encountered this once um, in all the projects that I've done, which was Uh, with the truth booth, um, I had a woman go into the truth booth and record her truth, and we don't actually get to see the truths until we take the interface back home and download um, all the stuff off of it. Um, but about maybe an hour or so afterwards, she comes running up to me, and we're still outside and showing the booth and inviting people in, and she's like, hey, can you erase mine? <laughs> and I was like, excuse me? She's like, I, I need you to really erase that. I, I don't need anybody to see that. And it was at that moment that I was like, what do I do? As you know, you, you signed the waiver, <laughs> you did the waiver, you, you, you press the record button yourself. We don't press it for you, you press it yourself. And then, you know, you unload your truth. And, you know, it, at that moment, it becomes like this idea question of, well, you know, this must be great, this must be provocative, this must be something interesting. As an artist, I'm like, you know, really excited at this moment. Um, but as a human being, I completely understand, like sometimes we say stuff and, you know, we think back and go, maybe I didn't want to say that out loud. Um, and, you know, she had a moment where, you know, it hadn't been seen, it hadn't been downloaded, it hadn't gone anywhere else. Um, and that she could ultimately take that back you know, in some way by me deleting it. And, you know, and what I ended up doing was I actually sat down and had an hour long conversation with her about what she said um, and decided to delete it um, and decided, you know, it was, it was for her sort of uh, almost like a therapy session. Um, and I think that sometimes, you know, with some of the projects and the participatory nature of them is that it can be almost like a therapy uh, for people. And that is, you know, just for them. It's private. It's something for them. And, you know, it became incredibly agreeable. I, I still think about it all the time and like, you know, like, man, that'd have been so amazing for everybody else to witness this moment with me. 
but it also becomes something for myself, you know, like this is for me and her. And we had this moment, we had an hour conversation about it and, you know, and that's, it's just good, you know, it just feels good. And it just goes into the, sort of the ether of thought and theory and, you know, there it is. <laughs> Bigger amorphous process that's behind all of these. Other questions from the, from the fellows? I'll read one in that case. Uh, from Gabrielle Vieira Posada, very powerful and inspiring creation experiences. Question, as creators, we usually put our attention and work in the creative process as such, more than in the diffusion of our results to wider audiences. Any ideas to surpassing this difficulty? Maybe I, in a way, Will, you were just, you were talking, I mean, this, this raises the question of who sees these things? How are they distributed? Is that relevant to the project? Oscar just told us, here's a, a scent, you know, one of the things you're, you're really best known for is not really out in the world as such. Will, you're, tell, you're talking to us about people's uh, addresses and what we can learn from, you know, the, 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 uh, where people are writing in from, but but what about that bigger issue of distribution and staying on top of it? Is that is that relevant to the projects? I think one of the 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 values that we had or guiding principles for High Rise, which was a bit different than many other National Film Board of Canada projects, was um, that not everything was for everybody. So we were going to produce a lot of things, and they were going to be you know, the, the, the final digital documentary that maybe was really of interest to New York Times audiences was of absolutely very little interest or no interest to people at Kipling Avenue here in, at the High Rise in Toronto. So we, we also did lots of work there and there's many outcomes of that work that I consider in many ways more important um, than sort of the splashy stuff online. So it's, it's also that, um, I think, you know, talking about ephemeral or, um, prioritizing like what matters when you have so many different types of artifacts coming out of a project it's it's always important to keep that in, in perspective I think in the the um, ephemeral impact or the impact that an ephemeral experience can have can be really um, can go wide and, and far from from the original uh, conditions in which the work was done, right? The work doesn't have to travel in its entirety, but if it, if it, if it made an imprint in the right, you know, surface, which is to say, you know, it reached the ears and the eyes and the conversation of, of certain language making group of people, then it, the, the, the work doesn't have to travel in, in its entirety. You know, there, there was a, um, one of the one of my best teachers of art in, in back in Chile, and he's kind of one of the, those figureheads in the art visual arts uh, scene. He made his biggest piece, his most renowned piece, is uh, sending big painting, massive paintings, you know, six by four by by ten, six by ten foot feet paintings uh, that can be folded into envelopes, so they can travel the whole world inside a letter and, and the, 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 the price, the value, you know, the cost is the cost of sending a letter. That thing, you know, he, he called the political element in this painting is in the creases and the folding of the paper, right? He's turning that wall size into a letter size. Uh, and I think about that a lot, you know, it doesn't have to travel the whole thing, it doesn't have to be expensive and it doesn't have to be uh, rich hundreds of thousands of people it just needs to reach the right people. So let me just pick up on the, on that, on the question of, of access and okay, reaching the right people. One of, I've spent a lot of my life in archives and one of the struggles I have is a, is a, an archival mentality that can be, you know, that the job is to preserve and protect, but not necessarily to share not necessarily to reveal the, maybe in a few generations it'll be good to know about but right now the safest then best thing you can do is just hide it away and you know it's, uh, some archives are that way most most are more open 
but but what about access? Is 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 the preservation question bound up in finding formats that are that are accessible to those who who need it and would benefit from it, like folding this thing up and making it available to those who want it, or um, or is it about securing? And how do you how do you see that? How how what forms can your work you know like the linear video form of Question Bridge has reached a ton of people. The radio component of One Millionth Tower reached a lot of people. Um, how do you imagine that, that, the question of access? So for us in working with Question Bridge, one of the big things is, uh, was access. Um, that's why we created a five channel and a single channel version of it. Um, you know, the five channel was big, it had big TVs, had all this like equipment that was attached to it in order to make the five TVs, you know, interact in synchronicity. Um, but then there was the single channel, which I think I said earlier, we brought into like a YMCA. We could take that and put it on a TV screen, one TV screen or a projection screen. You know, it was able to travel, do film festivals and, you know, movie theaters and uh, be projected on the side of buildings and inside of houses or, you know, wherever it could fit um, and it was easily accessible. And that was one of the big drivers to why I think Question Bridge was, we worked on Question Bridge for five plus years and continued to create, you know, um, a curriculum and run the website of still gathering content um, and then on top of that, you know, the book kind of coming out at the end and people still being interested in Question Bridge five years down the road um, for a book to actually come into life. And, you know, it, one of the interesting things that I think about the book was that when we were doing the book, I was thinking to myself, I was like, I don't know who's going to pick up this book, you know, um, like who as, you know, sort of print. We, we, I think the fear of print going out of date or whatever it is, you know, but, um, you know, I realized at the end, oh, this is actually a way to keep it intact um, as sort of, you know, we start, you know, coming off of exhibiting um, the piece as artists and it transitions maybe into institutional um, holding the piece, uh, we were very lucky that the National Museum of African American History and Culture, um, you know, wanted to bring it into their collection. So like that for us is a big piece to have it, but that's one place in the world that has it, you know, um, I believe, the, and the Brooklyn Museum as well. But again, those are only individualized places that have them and they're very physical. You know, you have to go there to go be a part of it or whatever. Um, but now there's like a book that also is there for you to pick up when you want to. So I think having, you know, being able to fit into multiple places and that being a lasting presence in people's minds and then having something that could be reprinted over and over again by the publisher is also something that's amazing to just be able to have. A question and, uh, from Rob Eagle, and it's a good one. Um, is there a case to be made for forgetting and anti-archiving? Some works like performances are meant to be experienced in a particular time and place, not to be preserved. Preserving kills the dynamism and doesn't do justice to the true experience. So what about the... Oscar, I'm going to mime the I'm answers sorry. to this one. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I love it. Love it. Uh, I, I'm all up for that. Um, to amplify it, to amplify the, um, the subtraction operation that it, it's proposing, you need to have some sort of resistance, uh, a resistant surface against it. Um, against the, uh, which it can be um, subtracted. Yeah, this is like the, do you remember the, the Kunic erasure? The, um, was a, a drawing that, that the whole thing, the whole gist about the drawing was being erased. It's an art piece. Um, but what I'm saying is, do you need some sort of resistance on the canvas 
So when you put your, your brush, you know, you can leave a marking. If, you, if there is no canvas and you just do something that's, that's, that's just not going, not, not going to have a disappearing act, then I think um, there's less amplification. So probably what I'm saying is if we can forget something, we need to be able to see it first, right? So I'm all, all up for the poetic act um, with the proviso that, that, you know, if you're going to do it, let's make it big, loud, and then where, where has it gone? Cat. Yeah, and uh, these are huge questions for live performance and performative art, and I appreciate that. But I also would argue that we live in a phenomenally a historical time, a time where, you know, what happened five minutes ago doesn't matter. And so I think we need a literacy of history and an appreciation of our, you know, the pasts that people have lived and um, to, uh, to just to work in forms that uh, don't somehow um, give frameworks for that kind of literacy, I think is, is, is um, not only sad, but dangerous. So I think uh, I appreciate the, you know, the separation of the canvas and the gesture, but um, in this time, we need a canvas. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah, that, that's, that's what I was after. Like, we, you need a canvas, you need some sort of resistance against to which make the marking. Um, if anything, if anything, it could be that sense of, of we can all update something that has passed whether that is history, whether that is your lineage, your family, you know, the connections, your identity, you can update it. And, and claiming that without having to um, carry the load and, the, and bearing the weight of whatever is that thing that you're updating, you just claim it. Hopefully, I'm, I mean, I'm with you in terms of we need literacy. If we can have the methods, and, 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 and when I say methods, that it doesn't sound like an academic thing, it sounds like a, like a citizen thing, right? Something that we can do because we know how to do it. Then we can claim access to updating whatever is that heavy thing that we try to update. History, family, identity, etc. Community, yeah. Yeah. Will, any thoughts? Uh, you know, it's interesting because I, I think I've talked a lot about archiving and where things have gone, but there's also, for me, a sense of not dwelling on the past like i think the memory of the projects is probably maybe the most important thing um in order to form other artists and other projects for the future you know so there's like this idea of i don't i wouldn't call it anti-archiving or forgetting anything because i think we should never forget our history we should never forget where things come from um but i think there's a place for them and then you know to kind of step out of the way for other artists and other projects and other people to, you know, build off of what we've done um, and create other engaging and interesting things that, you know, talk about history and uh, life of the time, you know, to go further. And so people can build off from that. Yeah. And I guess that's what distinguishes history from being an antiquarian where you just collect the past, but it's sort of gathers dust versus being in a dialogue with it versus a kind of a dialogic living, breathing entity. Well, listen, believe it or not, time has come and gone. I want to thank you, Oscar and Will and Kat, uh, for sharing your time with us and your thoughts. And I found, I've, it's, to be honest, I found this really incredibly useful in terms of the report that I'm also writing. So thank you. It's really been a, served as an important corrective to some of what I've been saying. I appreciate it. Sarah, I'm going to throw it back to you. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. That was an incredible panel. And um, for those who are interested, IDFA Doc Lab is also going to be doing some panels and, and uh, performances with this, uh, on this question of preservation. So we'll be sending out notices about that, but keep your eyes and ears out for that. Um, thank you to all of you for joining us. And next week, we'll be back with Caroline Cinders, who's in designer, researcher, and has created a feminist data set. So thank you until next week. Goodbye.